Okay, I think we'll um, we'll start today's session. So, hello to everyone that has joined us here today. Um, my name is Una McGuinness. I'm the Global Marketing and Strategy Director here at Hanover. Um, thank you, as I, as I said, to everyone that's joined and for your investment of time. I think today's event is really going to be something I think that's going to expand your thinking around the topic of DE&I and well-being as we look at the link between the two and how you as an individual and a leader, how, how your performance is impacted by both. So I'm joined here today by Brent Herman, who's the DEI specialist and partner here within our Hanover Talent Solutions, and Jonathan Hook, who is an organizational mental health expert and director of learning at CHX Performance. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit more at the end of the session about how um, Hanover and CXX Performance might be able to help you and your business. And um, just in terms of housekeeping, I'm sure we're all very familiar with the um, Zoom um, webinar features. So please, um, at the end of the session, we'll be having a Q&A. So please do ask any questions in the, um, in the chat, in the Q&A box. And um, I'll be watching the chat box as well, but it'd be great if you could put any questions in the Q&A box. If they're specifically for the panellists, please do so, or if it's for everyone, um, just, just add them in there. Um, but please do get involved. Um, and that's enough for me now, so I'll um, hand over to our wonderful hosts and really hope you enjoy the session here today. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much, Una, and uh, a big warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us on the webinar today. As a quick introduction from myself, Una has already said I'm a partner at Hanover within our talent solutions business. I head our diversity, equity and inclusion practice and solution, bringing 15 years of previous management consulting experience and a couple of years of in-house experience as well, qualified as a business psychologist in terms of my career and my career trajectory. Um, a couple of things I will share that with you all though about myself uh, more on a personal level because I do think today one of the key pieces of the, the webinar that we'll be covering is around diversity, equity and inclusion and really is in a, is in and of itself uh, a link to thinking about well-being. It's being able to be your authentic self and to bring your authentic self to work uh, and engaging in, in all of the different activities that you do. So to that point, you'll be able to tell by my accent, um, although I'm based in the UK and coming to you from just outside of North London, I'm originally from South Africa, so I bring some experience um, of being an expat and what that may feel like and how that impacts on oneself from a well-being perspective as well. I'm also Jewish by religion, uh, something I'm particularly proud of. Uh, I don't necessarily follow religion by the book, but it is indeed something that I identify with. Uh, and hold very uh, dear to my heart uh, and also was recently diagnosed with an autoimmune condition a couple of years ago and I'm also a gay man in a long-term relationship and I share those things openly again to the point of a creating a safe space for all of us here today and b really as a means of role modeling in terms of being able to bring who we truly are authentically to work in a way that really creates uh, a space for us to flourish. I'm really pleased as well to be joined by our partners from CHX Performance, Jonathan Hook, CHX, our specialist in organisational mental health and well-being. And I'd like to hand over to Jonathan just to introduce himself. Thank you very much, Brent. Yep. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I've been with CHX for three and a half years. I'm the Director of Programmes and Learning. I work closely with clients to tailor programmes to meet some of the specific needs they've identified in their organization. I've been a business leader. I was managing director of Carphone Warehouse for, uh, for just over four years during the period of the fastest growth in the UK, uh, where we won numerous accolades for how we treated our people. Uh, and then latterly, I, I retrained as a primary uh, school teacher and then became a, a head teacher. And I specialize in turning around schools in uh, deprived neighborhoods. Both great experiences to help me understand a little bit more about uh, mental health and organizations and how, how people feel um, so I look forward to showing more of that with you later. Thank you, Brent. Fantastic. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, so we're going to um, move over then to our slides for today and just share with you a couple of the objectives uh, for today as well. So if we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So we'd like to look at really creating a little bit more of a, a deep dive and understanding of the current context that we live in and the direct impact that has on well-being for all of us uh, today on the webinar to explore, of course, the key bridges and the link between well-being and diversity, equity and inclusion. 
And of course, we want to leave you with some practical insights to think about what can you do back in your organization uh, in order to really uh, take hold of well-being and mental health in a way that's going to drive some impact going forward. And we'll also offer you an opportunity to share some things that I'm sure you're doing already, given we have a lot of people joining the webinar today. We'll have a great deal of collective experience, and we'd love to tap into that uh, later on in the chat. So it gives you an opportunity to steal with pride from others as well. All right, next slide, please. So let's just start to set the scene around how we make the link between mental well-being and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think if we cast our minds back. Uh, a couple of years uh, very recently, we would have all experienced, perhaps to a very different extent, the COVID-19 pandemic as an example that I think, A, certainly brought mental health and well-being on the radar for many people where it wasn't perhaps before, but also an example that we can all really resonate with in terms of our varying individual and different experiences of that pandemic. It takes us into a space then through the webinar to focus in two ways, one around our own self-awareness and secondly around how we impact either intentionally or mostly unintentionally those around us and what that means when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion and looking after mental health and well-being. I think it is important in that context that this is not only about how we impact other people, but it is also an opportunity for us to look in the mirror and to think about what are the contexts, the situations that we found ourselves in where some triggers or some of our behavior may actually push us into a space of imposter syndrome, which I'm sure each of us would feel in different situations and at different points in time in our life and in our career. And how does that then impact our mood? How does that then impact our emotion? And what does that mean for the impact we have, again, either intentionally or not, on the people around us? I think if we add to that the complexity of the world that we live in, that we operate in a system. We're not just people at work, but we also are people in life. We also have people that work and operate in a society and in a broader world around us. There's something about being curious about all of the differences that we bring and that other people bring to our teams, to our organizations, to our communities, and to our world. And being curious is really important in understanding and appreciating difference in other people and creating an opportunity and a platform for us to really develop a sense of empathy and understanding of those differences. Of course, by doing that behaviorally, it will drive a really great impact in terms of looking after and addressing more of an environment where people can flourish and more of an opportunity where we can look after people's mental health and well-being and, of course, take ownership of that for ourselves as well. Many examples do come to mind in this space. Being part of the LGBTQIA plus community myself, I think one of those examples is certainly in terms of coming out as a gay person, as a lesbian person, as a trans person, and starting to take a pause point to think about where should the power sit? Does it sit with me asking other people's permission to come out? Or does it sit with me allowing other people into my world and letting them in? I think certain situations like that, being able again to bring your authentic self to an organization is in and of itself an example of where mental well-being can flourish or where it can actually languish or cause us a great deal of anxiety and stress. Certainly for women in the workplace, very relevantly at the moment, we talk about perimenopause and the menopause and starting again to become a lot more educated than perhaps we were in the past around how menopause and perimenopause will impact women's well-being at work. How does that uh, create, how do we create an environment and enough support in order to accelerate women's uh, careers and ensure that those biological um, challenges are not things that get in the way for women, but really create an, a supportive environment in order to allow career progression to continue unabated regardless of that. We also look at examples like microaggressions. So anybody, all of us, I'm sure in different shapes and forms have been on the receiving end of microaggressions. Again, if we are on the receiving end of that behavior consistently, how might that impact our well-being? How might that impact our mental health? 
Uh, and in addition to that, an example which a client actually had mentioned to me not very long ago, which I thought was another great example that certainly could resonate with everyone here in the current context, they had referenced an example of a manager almost uh, saying to their team at the point in time, I don't want any children on your lap during virtual meetings. And a colleague of this manager had actually overheard the instance and had said to them, do you have children of your own? And they'd said, no, I don't. Have you raised a child before? No, I haven't. And they challenged this manager by saying, if you think about the impact of how your behavior may impact other people's mental health and well-being in your team, there's a very big difference between supporting their situation of having a child on their lap, which they may do in and of itself creates anxiety for the person if they feel there isn't another option, if perhaps they've been let down by their daycare or by a carer, they themselves may feel a great deal of stress and anxiety already in that situation. The manager, however, could support them in encouraging them to engage in looking after their family and also being the best at work in a supportive environment, as opposed to passing a rule that says, absolutely not, we're not gonna permit this here and to what impact that then creates a lot more anxiety and stress for that person, as opposed to an environment that creates a lot more support and understanding for their personal circumstance and situation. I thought it was a great example. It may resonate with many people. And again, being curious and understanding difference and being empathetic and creating a supportive environment for the people that work in our teams and in our organizations. So there are just a couple of examples that hopefully start to create the bridges, start to create connections for you around mental well-being and DEI. Next slide, please. We're going to share a couple of stats with you now. These come from varying sources, uh, Deloitte, AXA Health Survey, as well as Harvard Business Review. And if we can pull up the first quote there, we can see that a third of organizations are addressing well-being for disabled employees and mental well-being related to culture and ethnicity. I think the, certainly the positives there is that a lot of work is already happening in this space. But certainly looking at that stat, I think there is a great deal of opportunity for us to do even more and much opportunity for us to impact in our organizations. If we can have a look at the next one, we see 49% of employers say they have a strategy for supporting women's health and for men's health. And the difference, they're not hugely different in terms of men and women. I always look at that with a great deal of appreciation. I think it does talk to a philosophy of inclusion for all and really addressing the needs of all of our employees in a way that uh, creates that inclusion for all and doesn't create exclusion or marginalize certain groups over and above others. LGBTQ folks, two and a half times more likely to experience depression, anxiety, and substance misuse. So again, creating awareness of different communities. Again, thinking about the systemically, it might not necessarily be about things that we have to manage and challenges that we deal with at work, but working in a broader society, being a broader person outside of work, all of the things that we do need to be cognizant of and address and provide a support towards. And then the final two quotes, we can see a opportunity here to think about the benefit of being really proactive versus being reactive in our approach. So for every pound spent on mental health interventions, employers are seeing five pounds back in reduced absence, presenteeism and staff turnover. And I think that in, in and of itself is a great example of being proactive in the space, as opposed to poor mental health costing UK employers up to 45 billion pounds each year with a rise of 16% since 2016 could be very much a consequence of us being too reactive to some of these different factors and not being proactive enough in our approach. Just a comment on that, Brent, the, um, for the Deloitte statistic there, um, if, if the um, intervention is whole company, uh, it's focused on preventative good mental health and it's enabled with tech, then the return was 11 uh, pounds to every pound spent. So this is where sticky plaster strategy versus a, a whole company strategy really um, it, it needs to be explored. Absolutely. Thanks, Jonathan. And we're going to become a lot more curious now and explore the space of mental wealth, well-being and wellness, certainly from a biology perspective, in starting to understand mood and emotion from Jonathan and CHX's performance. 
uh, perspective. And an example, again, just to set the scene that comes to mind, is sometimes we may find ourselves in situations where we receive a degree of feedback and we take that personally and we react in the moment as opposed to really taking a pause point to think about how best we can react, how best we can put the best version of ourselves forward in that particular situation. And I'm really interested, Jonathan, as we move to the next slide in understanding a little bit more from you around mood, emotion, and the regulation of that within ourselves as human beings. Thank you so much, Brent. Thanks for setting that scene with some you know, really common examples that many of us would have uh, seen or experienced ourselves. So this first slide, I mean, just the very piece of data that you can all read, you know, World Health Organization metadata tells us that 80% of mental ill health stems from dysregulated, mood, uh, dysregulated feelings. And our feelings are a mood and emotion. Now that in itself is kind of deeply shocking. But we have to think a lot more about feelings, our mood and emotion. Feelings pretty much underpin everything to do with people in business, from day-to-day -day engagement, collaboration, cognitive function, all of which drives productivity, through to decision-making and even to strategic planning. But what we know from working with organisations and from listening to the needs that they have, feelings are widely misunderstood in business. Um, in many, many cases, they're completely undervalued. They're often viewed as disruptive, or even unprofessional. And there are lots of organisations where that legacy of feelings are things that are left at home and that you don't bring them to work. But that's still a legacy in many organisations' culture. Um, but for us, they're, um, they're probably some of the most important information you have to, to be successful at work, do all your work and remain in good health. So let's just have a little look. What are feelings? So mood, Mood is uh, a signal. It's about our physical survival. It's about all the processes going on inside us, the homeostatic processes, such as thermoregulation, our blood sugar, blood pressure, rhythm, endocrine systems, all of those things. And it's a bit like a car dashboard. Hopefully on your car dashboard at home, you haven't got any flashing lights. Well, our mood's a bit like that. Hopefully everything's going on inside those normal bandwidths of homeostatic operation but sometimes things go wrong and you get a flashing light. And that's a mood signal telling us uh, that our resources are low. And then we have emotions. Again, emotions are signals. They are biological, they change our biology. And they are all about our social survival. They are uh, signals that are generated from something external to our body. That's usually a someone or a something. And in evolutionary terms, social survival was utterly critical. If you were excluded from your social group, from your herd, the reality is you would probably die. We've all seen those David Attenborough programs with the little wildebeest struggling along at the back, and we all know what happens to that. So that drive to be included is critical to survival. And we carry that now with us uh, deeply inside our biology. So we have these things, mood and emotion, feelings, they change our biology and they give us information. And the, the quote there from the World Health Organization about dysregulated feelings, we don't just suddenly wake up one day and our feelings, our mood and emotions are dysregulated. This is something that happens over a period of time. Emotions and moods, they evolve to be uh, sorted out quickly, we restore our mood and we resolve our emotion. But if we don't do that, that activated biology, the signal stays with us and it impacts our health, impacts our focus, it biases our attention and the long term, and I'll show you long term where that takes us. But I really want to think about this from a, a, a D, D, E and I perspective. Let's look at those three words, diversity. Well, from a biological perspective, diversity is critical, critical to the survival of a species. You know, our genetic diversity is why we are, the, without doubt, the most socially, the most successful social animal that's ever existed. And so when we know also that when um, populations reach critically low points, that lack of diversity is like a tipping point where they become extinct. And it's the same in organizations. We need diversity for, for inbuilt idea resilience. So that's the diversity piece. But then let's look at equity and inclusion. Well, equity and inclusion are two of our five human needs. We need equity, inclusion, autonomy, 
certainty and attachment, that sense of being valued. So looking at um, equity and inclusion, if we don't get that, um, it triggers emotions, it changes our biology. And, and CHX, we define psychological safety uh, as, an, as an environment where those five mammal needs are met. Uh, and if they are met, that is where you have psychological safety. If I can now move on to the next slide, please. Let's have a look now at the impact of mood and emotion on our mental health. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now this mental health continuum, it's, it's, it's a, a really important um, thing that we share with all of our clients at the very first engagement. It does a number of things. The first thing it does, it makes it clear that we mental health is not, a, you don't just have a certain mental health. You can move up and down this continuum. We all have mental health all of the time. And it's completely normal to be anywhere on this continuum. We work with a very large global law firm and the managing partner looked at this graph in one of our workshops and laughed out loud and said, it's not even lunchtime and I've been in every place already on this graph. So it's a lovely way of accepting the normality of mental health, but also it starts to put mental health in the context of something to aspire to, good mental health. Who wouldn't want to be on the right-hand side of that continuum? Who wouldn't want to feel energetic or content or hopeful? And from an organizational point of view, who wouldn't want the majority of their people there? But the reality is, as you can see from this distribution curve, the vast majority of people are in the center in moderate mental health. And then again, thinking back to diversity inclusion, the thing about that data point that Brent shared on the LGTBQ folks, 2.5% more likely to feel depression, anxiety, and substance misuse. But if you think about that drip, drip, drip of microaggressions, relentless, what that does to your sense of equity and inclusion, it's gonna drive you to the left-hand side of this continuum because you can't resolve that emotion. That emotion goes from being disturbed as a signal to a permanent dysregulated emotion, a permanent change in your biology which impacts your health. And this we see in organizations commonplace. It's the beginning of the, um, the, the disengaged, withdrawal, departure cycle. And if they don't depart, they burn out. So some people departure is, is what their dysregulated mood drives them to do. For others, it's burnout. They, they love being there, they can't go anywhere else, but they, they carry on regardless and they burn out. So this is really important um, from a DNI perspective. Brent. I think it's really interesting what you mentioned previously around psychological safety as well, because certainly one of the things that this gets me thinking about is when we create a space in an organization that is fearless and we feel like we can speak up without the fear of recourse, how much that pushes us to the right-hand side of this continuum and creates a space for us to really flourish and experience some of those really positive mood and emotions. Whereas if we are working in an organization with a sense of fear, where perhaps hierarchy gets in the way or we get in our own way in certain respects, uh, that can create a, a space for moderate mental health. It could push us into languishing. It could even push us into mental illness uh, if we do allow it to get the better of us to that extent. And it also does uh, create some very clear links for us around DEI in the context of leaders uh, and how bias and unconscious bias may unintentionally get in the way of us providing our team members with uh, equal opportunity to development and stretch assignments or providing uh, an equal platform for constructive feedback. Sometimes unintentionally as a result of bias and unconscious bias, we put our effort into people who are like us. Um, it puts it puts our effort in, you know, we put our effort into people who we connect with because it's easy, it's convenient, it's preferable. It's a human thing that we do that we just need to be aware of and think about how we manage that more effectively and what impact that is having on the people who don't have access to those opportunities or who don't have access to that feedback because they may be so different to us as the leader. How might that then also push them to the left-hand side of the curve we see on the screen? Completely, Brent. The, the, the impact um, 
that leaders have is phenomenal, which is obviously not a surprise. But when a leader is on the left hand side of this, they're feeling agitated, anxious, which many leaders do. They're often in some very tough places in some sandwiches uh, at work, which are really hard from the top and, and from above and below. So it's common for them to be in that moderate mental health or languishing. But when you're there, your ability to be empathic to others, to feel how others are feeling is significantly reduced. You are when you are pushed to the left hand side, you are territorial, you are hostile, you're argumentative. So your ability to look after others, to, to lead by how you make others feel, to acknowledge inclusion and equity is severely diminished. And this is a significant problem at the leadership level in lots of organizations. When organizations talk about humanizing leadership, this is at the core of that. You can't behave very nicely to other humans if you yourself have poor mental health. Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree with that and would also add that it, it almost in and of itself, what you've said starts to address the question we had there in the chat from Lana about, you know, what you do when you fear repercussions for management due to highlighting issues with management. I think management leaders, all of us in and of ourselves, have an opportunity to do some really effective role modelling, whether that is about demonstrating inclusive behaviours and allowing other people to observe that and feel like they can do the same in the environment they work in, or whether it is from a psychological safety perspective, being able to demonstrate the right kind of behaviors to say, I do want your views, I do want your opinions, uh, and creating enough of a space in an organization to do that creates more of a culture that lends itself to psychological safety. And I think a lot of this is about incremental steps it's about to your point the drip feeds that we do in uh demonstrating positive behavior that just starts to create an incremental shift in culture i don't think for any of these things there's a you know silver bullet uh, or a one action that can have a great impact but i do think it is about small things that we do and role modeling that we do that starts to create a safer space and starts to create more opportunity for the people around us yeah and and again, from a leadership perspective, leaders are role modeling all the time. But if you're in that language, if you're on the left hand side, what are you role modeling compared to what you might be role modeling on the right hand side? So leaders have a very important personal responsibility to be to proactively think about how to maintain good mental health so that they can lead in a way that en enables others to feel safe themselves. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure, Jonathan, that uh, everyone is curious to know well, what could they actually do in terms of moving this agenda forward around DEI and well-being. And uh, as I said in the beginning, when we, we opened the webinar and I just set the scene and positioning a couple of things, um, we do want to offer you the opportunity to share your collective experience. We've got a lot of people on this webinar, um, so it would be super if you would uh, give us some of your thoughts in the chat around things that you have done or that you do uh, in order to drive your DEI agenda forward and look after the mental health and well-being of your organization and your people. But here are a couple of suggestions for you to take away as some practical tips. So the first one we have there is around sharing stories about people's personal journeys. I've uh, referenced their menopause working group as an example because I think it's about creating a space for people who uh, are facing similar headwinds or challenges uh, and addressing that in, in a safe environment where we can connect with people who are like us from a support perspective. And you could either create those working groups independently or you could certainly make them part of your employee representative group initiatives that you have running in your organizations. Uh, secondly, is around encouraging employees to take a more active role in their well-being. Uh, and certainly I'd heard uh, a previous talk by Simon Sinek a couple of months ago where he was quite deliberate about saying that his approach to this is certainly asking two key questions of a team in a meeting, which is, as you see on the slide, what are you working on and how can I support you? And sometimes even asking them in two separate meetings in a week where you have different touch points with your team. And I think that creates a really great balance between the task and, and the work that needs to be done, but equally uh, a real concern and a genuine energy around well-being and looking after mental health and wellness for your people and your teams. 
Facilitated group discussions, another example there of something that you can do. You could even focus on topics that are specific around microaggressions as an example, and really create an opportunity and again, a safe space for people to start to talk about some of their experiences and how they could counter some of those experiences in a way that keep them on the right hand side of that curve in the space to flourish. And finally, equipping managers to address mental health. I think, again, providing a high quality preventative mental health education could certainly be incredibly helpful in the space. And I know as we progress uh, through a couple more slides, Jonathan, you'll also be talking about CHX's yeah. um, Scientists of Yourself program, which is an example, again, of some of that mental health education that can be on offer. Yeah. And just to add on. Uh... From, a, from a, when we work with clients, what we see is the biggest win is that realisation that become, it goes right back to your first slide, uh, Brent, where you talked about self-awareness. Our mood and emotions are telling us so much about uh, our own, how we're doing ourselves and how we're interacting with other people around us. Yet we ignore that information. So we don't spend any time. We are so busy in our lives, um, home and at work. We do not take a pause, a moment to self-reflect, uh, to see how we're doing, and then understand the consequences of, of, that, that that has on us and on our behaviours. And this is the biggest area. We evolved to respond very quickly to mood and emotion, to make those changes that help us get back into uh, uh, increase our chances of survival. In the modern world, we are losing our innate ability to know how we're doing and therefore uh, how we're doing personally and how we're going to do as part of our social environment. And this is the big area uh, to focus on. Absolutely, and I certainly see comments in the chat and we appreciate that. Some people sharing uh, a few things that they've done. And I think one of the, the interesting ones there is around challenge uh, and constructive and positive supportive challenge towards other people to start to create again, a greater sense of self-awareness uh, in terms of what might my impact be on others uh, in terms of my behavior and further to your point, Jonathan, in terms of gaining an awareness around my mood and emotion and thinking about how that impacts people and the feelings that that evokes and provokes in them as well. Uh, and again, you know, challenges that we all face day to day, as I see also shared in the chat around sleep deprivation and again, how that may uh, impact, of course, again, on our well-being in general and our, our moods and emotion as well. Um, but uh, certainly um, also the point that there should always be a safe space for whistleblowing. And again, I think that just talks to the importance, again, of a fearless organization and the role that we can play in starting to create more psychological safety in that environment where we actually are encouraged to do the right thing in a way that doesn't have any recourse for us or our career. I think a lot of the time people also hold back on sharing aspects of themselves at work because there is always this fear and the sense of what might the implication of that be for me and I think there's a lot we can do behaviorally within our culture in order to set up more positive uh, environments and a safer environment for people to engage in the right kinds of behaviors aligned to the values of our businesses. Yeah just one comment on that on the chat uh, it's from video video I, I know nothing of the circumstances but it feels to me like a really powerful example of what we talked about on that mental health continuum where how you feel um you didn't sit comfortably with that organization so your mammal needs were your human needs were not met that sense of equity how your ceo was behaving eventually drove you to be from withdrawal and you you departed and you now say you feel better so this is this is mood and emotion driving that behavior and you now feel better and i'd imagine therefore your mood and uh, and how you feel is resolved but it's a, a powerful and real life example of what we know happens in organizations all the time. Great, thanks Jonathan. All right, so we're gonna move on to uh, the next couple of slides really, just to talk to you a little bit more about uh, Hanover Talent Solutions as well as CHX Performance. I have referenced as well their program around Scientist of Yourself. So we'll share a little bit more information for you around that as well. But firstly, starting with Hanover Talent Solutions, um, again on the slide, uh, you can see that we can help you in many different aspects of management consultancy. We have a great database of very well experienced uh, coaches that can offer coaching on a wide range of topics. 
We also have a number of different webinars and workshops that we run on incredibly relevant uh, topics, the menopause being certainly one of those, um, engagement and retention programs, counseling support and helpline, and of course we do engage in a lot of speaking and events as well. Our leadership solutions practice, uh, very active in leadership development and also assessment and succession as well in ensuring that you have the right people in the right jobs in your organizations, as well as our practice around diversity, equity and inclusion. And given the topic today around DEI and well-being, um, we thought just to focus on the DEI piece uh, in a little bit more detail. So on the next slide, um, we'll have a look just at our approach there around uh, four ways in which we work with our clients. That is discover, define, deliver, and determine. Uh, and we can work with you and your organizations in the DI space on all of these or on some of them. I think it does talk to the way in which we uh, work with our clients collaboratively and with agility. Uh, discover can involve uh, audits. Uh, it can involve surveys at a board and an exec level to start to get a sense of people's perception of where where you're at from a DEI maturity perspective in your organization. And we also have a broader survey that can give you a sense of employee enablement and engagement from an employee effectiveness perspective through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also can substitute, uh, subst substantiate that with focus groups uh, to give you a qualitative view of data across uh, various groups in your business. Uh, we then move on to define to help you put a plan together, ensure that you have the right capability in-house in order to move that forward and that you focus your efforts in a way that's meaningful and purposeful. And that takes us into the space of deliver, which could be uh, a number of different options in the DI space. It's often informed by the discovery phase in and of itself. And you can see that is about finding and attracting, selecting talents, engaging in development, as well as defining and understanding how we can develop inclusive leadership and an inclusive culture, as well as deployment in terms of succession planning. Our determined phase will take very many different shapes and forms, depending on the initiative that we engage in with you. Certainly, some of those may be more tangible to demonstrate ROI. If it is, for example, around inclusive recruitment, you'd be able to get a handle on that through your retention and your attrition numbers in order to measure success. Um, and that becomes slightly more um, uh, challenging for us to think around in terms of the development angle, where we'd like to look then at more of your strategic goals and how we can measure the outputs of the development work to address those objectives in order to show you how the needle has moved on performance and also on your DEI agenda. So a lot uh, under the hood, so to speak, that we can offer you in the DEI space. And I'd like to hand over to Jonathan now to talk a little bit more about CHX performance. And as I've referenced multiple times, the great program around scientists of yourself. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, yes, so CHX Performance, um, there's a, a, a program, overall program, it's called Scientist of Yourself, and that's a really important thing. Our, our work is based on uh, the work and uh, research of our Director of Science, who is a Professor of Cognition and Neuroscience at the University of Kent, and also a Professor of Cognition and Anthropology at the University of Oxford. And he's published over 100 papers on mood, emotion, mental health and performance. So we have this wonderful grounding in some very com in, in, in complex, multidisciplinary science that we bring to life uh, for organizations in, in simple language that enables that science to change how people think about uh, mental health. We work with, we work in a number of sectors, high tech, education, a lot of work in law, in biopharma, FMCG, and we're, we're typically employed by, for by clients for two reasons. Firstly, we work in leadership development, which is where we are so proud to be partnering with Brent and the team at Hanover. We help leaders to become more human-centered leaders. And by that, we mean leaders who lead as much as how they make people feel as what they say and do. And this is right at the heart, at the core of most modern HR agendas. And feelings, the biology of them, is a wonderful coherent thread which brings all of these things together, psychological safe space, DE&I, engagement, trust, authenticity. They're all feelings, they're things you feel, you can't think them. And this is where we're doing a lot of our work at the leadership level. 
But we also work uh, with organisations more specifically on mental health and at all levels, through from individuals through to the whole organisation. And at the individual level, we help them better manage their mood, their stress and their energy. And then we help move from viewing mental health as a problem to be managed to that of an aspiration that underpins sustainable high performance in the organisation. It gives people and organisations a shared knowledge and an understanding of mental health, which in itself is valuable. But then on top of that, in doing that learning, they gain uh, and develop a shared language and a confidence to use it when talking about mental health. It increases the conversation. And we know that good mental health comes from ourselves and our self-awareness and how we engage with others. I can categorically tell you that tech is not an answer to mental health. It's each other, it's ourselves and how we get on with each other. And we help organizations ultimately move to what is would be described as a more pro-social a culture that in and of itself is supportive of good mental health. We see so many execs scratching their heads saying, I don't understand why we've got mental health, as if mental health was some kind of, um, some kind of terrible response to a, normal, um, to a normal culture, but it's not. Poor mental health is a normal response to a pathological culture. And when the C-suite begin to understand that kind of language, it's, it's quite transformative. Um, so that's uh, core of what we do, yeah, leadership development and, uh, and, and mental health. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Right, can we move to the next slide then and uh, over to Una. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, guys. There was um, lots and lots to think about there. And I think that um, you've covered a huge amount in a short amount of time, to be honest with you. I think that some of the things that really kind of resonated with me were, you know, how, how you talked about how obviously mood and emotion really tell us so much about, you know, ourselves and, 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 and how I think we spend little time reflecting on it. And also how to, you know, driving that kind of um, inclusivity at work. Be, you know, allowing people to have that sort of safe space to discuss things, obviously that, that the whole continuum ex, ex, exposed how many people are in that middle to languishing bit <laughs> at any one time in terms of their own mental health. So, so some really interesting things there. OK, a couple of questions that have come up. Um, I think one one of our um, delegates asked about you talked about um, you know leave your feelings at home and that kind of that kind of um, if you like top down approach. Do you think that's more prevalent in certain industries, or have you both seen that kind of approach that not enough companies are open enough to to, to having these conversations across industries? Do you think it um, or is it you know more prevalent in, in, in some some industries than others? Um, I'll start with this one if I may, Brett. We work in a lot of um, industries where knowledge is deeply important um, and your mm -hmm. reputation. So your 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 social status, if you like, is dependent on your reputation as being a, a subject matter expert. So the fear of looking um, or sounding that you don't know what you're talking about or, you, or you're challenging in that environment, the fear is very, very strong. So it's very difficult to be challenging. Um, of methods or, or, um, or knowledge in that environment. So that is a, is a very big challenge for, uh, for those. We see it an awful lot in the legal sector um, where it's difficult uh, for people to make those challenges. Mm, interesting, yeah, definitely. Um, and um, what, um, how would you, this come up in the chat, how would you describe psychological safety in a mental health context? Because we often take, talk about having that sort of safe space to, to be your um, authentic self, etc. But how does, um, how would you describe psychological safety in, in the mental health context? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick that one off, Jonathan, and feel free to, to come in as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it goes back again to the points we made at the beginning around self-awareness and impact, right? It's, it's an opportunity for you as an individual, whether you are a leader with a big or a small L, uh, to start to think about how do you show up and what impact is that having for you as well as for the people around you? It goes down to behaviors and I could give you some examples of this. So in, in one hand, if you are having a uh, virtual meeting with your team or with somebody in your team, uh, are you present? Are you engaging with them? Do they get both the verbal and nonverbal cues from you that you're interested in what they have to say and that you're present in the moment? 
versus are you unintentionally, because it is a lot of the time unintentional, um, engaging in multitasking where you're not really engaged with them. They can see that in terms of your eye contact on the screen. You might be fidgeting around with something else or you're busy answering something on your phone at the same time. And yeah. it's starting to test yourself and really gain a bit more awareness around how do some of those smaller behaviors, both the nonverbals and the verbals, mm. land up impacting a sense of disengagement, disinterest in what you have to say, and as a result erodes trust and erodes psychological safety. And I don't always think that we are as aware around mm. the small things that really have a big impact in terms of the messages we send out to the people around us. Yeah, because those small things obviously have an impact on someone's emotion, how they feel, for example, that day or when they step out of that meeting um, and they see that, like you're saying, there's a, there's a lack of engagement um, and then, you know, the task or the next thing they do, they might not approach it, like you're saying, at the, at the optimum point of their sort of performance. We thank you. We, Brent, what you said was so important. And we, call, we talk about emotional authenticity and this is the ability to say how you're feeling. And in organisations that we've talked about before, where it's not safe to do that, where you don't feel able to do that, you end up masking how you're feeling. Now, this is a massive challenge, and particularly for leaders. So if leaders are continually masking how they're feeling, they're putting on a show. They're, but we are brilliant to uh, reading how people feel. It's, we're hardwired to read the, the signs. So if how they look and how we are feeling how they're feeling is not matching what they're saying, that gap, is the authenticity gap. And that is where trust begins to become eroded and disengagement occurs. And so leaders who are unable to express how they are feeling because it's not safe or there's no culture, there's no language to do so, um, that is where a lot of the disengagement in organisations stems from. Mm, yeah. And I, I would just also add one last thing to that is I do think that in some organisations, and I say some because we certainly can't paint, paint everyone with the same brush, but I do think in some organisations, if you find yourself in a, in a meeting, for example, where you have a really emotional reaction to something or you start to become visibly emotional and start to cry about something, there's a big difference between telling somebody, oh, well, let's just take five minutes and have a break so you can you know, go off and, and, and get, gather, your, gather yourself towards yourself again and come back and carry on versus just being supportive in the moment and allowing that person to carry on if they so choose to do so. And I think that again, in and of itself, is a small difference, a small nuance in how we behave and how we deal with emotion at work that can send a very different message. The one being, it perhaps isn't appropriate here. You need to go in and, and you know, get yourself into a bit of space. And the other being, this is a supportive environment and we're here to support you in the moment. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Another question that's come in, um, I've got the two screens here. Um, how do you get C-suites on board with mental health when they are um, experiencing with getting, when they're experiencing, um, when they're getting results, but, but not dealing with mental health issues? So maybe, you know, as I said, business is getting results, but potentially not dealing with how do you get the, the C-suite on board? I'll have a start on that one, if you like, Brent. It's, it's, it's a big challenge. But what mm. we do know through the um, past couple of years is for many people, even at C-suite level, suddenly, for the first time in their lives, had a vulnerability about their own mental health, an anxiety wobble, a depression wobble. We, we, we've seen this and heard about it. So their lives, which are quite finely balanced, but working effectively, suddenly that balance disappeared and, mm. and well that that exposure and if they didn't have it themselves they certainly uh, were aware of someone close to them for whom they had their possible first ever kind of mental health wobble so that was a big shift in putting mental health much higher up on the corporate agenda um, for us uh, our first level of engagement is often at the c-suite uh, we will do a webinar or a program with them to change their understanding of what mental health is it's, for a lot of people, they still think it is something like you're sitting around in a circle and holding hands or it's pink and fluffy, all of these kind of perceptions, but it's not. It's based in biology. It's, it's real. We all have it. And um, it's at the heart of, of any, good mental health is at the heart of any sustained, successful business. 
Yeah, and I, I just re-emphasize the points around the fact that whether you're at the C-suite level or the board level or a senior manager or an individual contributor, it's about humanizing people at work. And I think to Jonathan's point, everybody is going to go through battles in their own lives. They perhaps, some people are a little bit more averse and comfortable to share some of that with their colleagues at work. And other people tend to be a lot more private and hold their cards closer to their chest. But I think it is about acknowledging that regardless of where you operate in terms of your level or your status or your title you're still a human at the end of the day and these things are going to affect us all equally yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um and um Brent, maybe one one for you in terms of um so leaders and um, you know have got so much to sort of juggle at the moment so, or at any time you know in terms of all the issues we're talking about today performance um etc how um where and how do you prioritize as a as a like you're saying a leader in a business what, what is what you, what should you be doing what are the kind of actions you should be um looking at yeah i mean i think it goes back to what i had said previously una about you know there is there is no one silver bullet to address mental well-being there is no one silver bullet to address diversity equity and inclusion mm. i think we all know that on this webinar it is about small actions that we all need to be doing over a period of time to see incremental difference and to, to move the agenda forward whether it is around mental health or whether it is around diversity, equity and inclusion. And at the end of the day, I think a useful way to think about it is where are the commonalities and what can I do practically day to day at work that's really going to help uh, impact the agendas in a, a multifaceted way. And so yeah. what's an example of that is thinking about behaviours like, for example, demonstrating empathy. You know, that can create uh, a great deal of comfort for people from a DEI perspective. It's, it's absolutely essential in terms of being curious and understanding differences around us and within ourselves. But equally, it is incredibly useful when it comes to driving psychological safety. It is incredibly useful when it comes to mental health and well-being. So I think it is about really joining the dots and thinking about how we do this in an integrated way where we can start to engage in behaviors and a culture that becomes something that addresses things in much more multifaceted than in vacuums mm -hmm. and silos. I think that's really the, the, the way forward. And it certainly is and the way we work with clients in terms of our approach is it's always integral as opposed to dealing with the verticals where you'll get some gains and wins, but it's not yeah. going to have as much breadth and impact across the piece. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Jonathan, anything to, to, to add on, on, on that? Or well, it, 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 how um, you work, you seeing you working with people? Yeah, just, the, I, I love what Brent said, it's, it's, it's complex. Um, and there are no silver bullets. That's really mm -hmm. important to understand uh, from a mental health perspective. Um, Self-responsibility um, is critical. People have to take an interest in their own mental health and they have to take responsibility to do something about it. And it's that shift. And a lot of people are happy to do that when it comes to physical health. You think of, they spend money on gyms. They really check their steps. They're doing all these things. But what are they actually doing to say, how can I move myself to the right-hand side of that continuum? And just as Brent said, it's often integrating a number of small things into their life, into their routines, that make quite a big difference in how restored you are, how, how well resourced you are to be able to take on the day, to take on the challenges and feel good in doing so. So it's 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 the small things. And that's where we really spend a lot of time with clients in our workshops is, is tailoring those actions for people. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. OK, well, I think we're um, we're almost at time um, now. We've just got a couple of questions. I hope everyone's really enjoyed the, the session and got um, lots out of it. I'm sure sure they have. I'm really sorry if we haven't been able to answer your questions. But at the end, we'll give you the contact details for Brent and um, for Jonathan, if you'd like to get in touch with them directly. We've just got a, um, a couple of um, questions would be great if you could give us some feedback so we, we know, um, you know, what you thought of the session and helping us kind of plan and add value um, in other ways. So could you let us know and just quickly, it'll take two minutes to, to vote here on our polls. How did you find, how did you value the content today? So really quick polls. So five being really, really valuable um, and um, one being uh, not at all. So if you could just um, quickly vote and let us know. Um, we like to have feedback like everybody. Um, that would be great. Uh, we're only seeing the results. I don't think people can actually, can people vote? I'm not sure it's working properly. No. Um, no, it's not. For some reason, it's just saying, let's move on to the next the next one. Um, you can't choose a number. 
Um, no. Okay, well, if you want to write in the chat what you thought, that would be great. Oh, <laughs> is this working? Um, yeah, try that one again. Try that one again. Bring that one up again. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Let's move on. Let's move on to the next poll because we're con I'm conscious of time. Um, so yeah, just let, let us know in the chat what you thought. That'd be great. Um, if we could move on to the next one. We can close that poll now. That's fine. Still there. And the next one. I can see lots of fives coming up in the chats anyway, guys. Um, uh, have we got the next poll there? Yeah. Um, did you get some actionable insights from today? So, you know, do you think you've got something that you can um, immediately take and, and, and benefit yourself and or your business? So yes, no, or maybe. Okay, and then the um, final poll that we have, how can we support you on this journey? So um, would you like to be contacted um, by Hanover and CHX DNI Solutions? So please let us know if you'd like to further the conversation um, for yourself, for your organization, or maybe not right now. Okay, I think that's probably, that's it. Just to, so just to, fit, to finish off, thank you very much guys um, for um, some fantastic content. And um, if we just go on to the next slide, yeah, we've got a couple of, um, obviously Hanover, we um, often, we do, and we have a number of events. We've got two events. We just wanted to let you know if you might be interested. Our next one is next week, which is how to launch your NED career and getting board ready. Um, and um, then next month we have a um, menopause webinar, which is entitled, Are You Failing the Men Menopausal Women in the Workplace? Where we've got a guest speaker, which is a Dr. Naomi uh, Potter to, um, to join us um, and talk about the subject. Um, and then the final slide we've just got. So if you'd like to get in contact with Brent or Jonathan, um, there are their email addresses, so please do so. So I think we are literally on sort of about one minute um, on time. So, um, so please do get into touch with Brent or Jonathan directly if you've got any questions or would like to further the conversation um, and, um, and hope that... Um, you know, I hope that you've really enjoyed. I really like the idea. I remember, you know, it's it's how it's how people make you feel, and I think um, I hope you've made people feel empowered and 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 really kind of more educated on the topics to, here today. So, um, thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Really, thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.